So I know my title is The Church and the Kingdom of Heaven, and we'll get there, but mostly I want to start at least by talking to you about dinner, about feasts and banquets. As some of you may know, I've had a bit of a rough stretch over the last year, and one of the first things I wanted to do as I removed, uh, returned to health is to cook dinner for my family. Uh, much of the worst of it started about a year ago now at Thanksgiving. I ended up in the hospital for a couple of weeks and they were there every day. And uh, I'm here to tell you, hospital food's not the best. And I wanted to do something that would honor and express gratitude. So last week I was back home in Michigan. I made dinner for them. I made some old family recipes. Um, high bars that were set for me long before I was born by my father who loved to make chicken Kiev and lobster bisque and that's what they wanted and that's what I tried to make. I didn't do great at the food but we had a ritual, we had time together, we toasted the ones who'd gone before and we toasted one another and we had a chance to celebrate the community of our family together. And I've been thinking about banqueting and dining, um, thinking about a church where I used to work, where every two or three months they had a practice that they called movable feasts. And anyone who wanted to be part of it would sign up, and then there was a secret algorithm in the mind of one very wise church member who divided all the people who signed up, 40, 50, 60 people, into a number of dinner parties that were hosted at members' houses. And they were all potlucks, and people showed up. They got to know people they'd never met in the church before. They got to spend time with old friends and make new ones. It was one of the most precious and holy things we ever did as a church. Or the time I've spent in food pantries, not unlike your own, making, making bag lunches for people who were most in need of them or potlucks. Oh my lord, I miss potlucks. I don't know why we don't do this anymore. Maybe you all do. I'm not part of a church that does it. I'm glad the AI, where's the AI, came up with potlucks because that's a great reason to support your church is when you can get together and share a meal. I used to entertain more when I was younger. Uh, my life has gone a little backwards, and I used to live in a bigger place, and now I live in a smaller place, and I don't have a, the room for the expansive dining table I want. But now, post-pandemic, post-health crisis, I'm realizing the size of the table isn't as important as the people you can fit around it. So I'm trying to cook more. I'm trying to have more people in. I'm trying to gather more. Right now in my family, the current question is Thanksgiving. And we've had about enough of the same old way, and we'll go back to it next year. But for this year, we're going to go celebrate Thanksgiving in perhaps the most American way possible. We're going to Disney World. But we're still going to have a meal. And I keep arguing with them. They want to find one of those, you know, uh, grocery stores where you can, like, buy a whole Thanksgiving meal. And I keep arguing, well, you know, the turkey won't be good as our turkey. The stuffing won't be as good as our stuffing. I, let's just have a taco bar and some mojitos and call that Thanksgiving. <laughs> but we all agree we made a need, uh, need a meal. And let me tell you one more thing about this Thanksgiving meal. All of my relatives from Macomb County, Michigan, about which you've heard so much, are going to be there. And they believe all of the things that being from Macomb County, Michigan, has come to symbolize. They believe we should kick out immigrants. They believe we should get rid of the CDC. They believe that Chicago is a crime-riddled hellscape. How can you even live there, they say to me. And I keep assuring them that I'm doing just fine. And they keep telling me to take my ivermectin. So I'm trying to figure out how to do Thanksgiving with my family. When I got the invitation to preach today, therefore, it's not surprising that I thought of this parable of the great banquet as the sermon uh, scripture for today. Jesus is at a dinner party. 
And someone offers up a toast, I want to think. Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, you know, that reminds me of a story too. Someone gave a great dinner party and invited many people. And at the time for the dinner, he sent out a messenger to invite everyone to come back to the house. Everything's ready, time to come to dinner. And they began to make excuses. All of those who'd been invited. I've bought a piece of land and I've got to go see it, check it out. I, 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 uh, I bought a bunch of oxen for my farm and I have to go get them. I've just got married. I can't come to the party. And I always like to point out these are not particularly bad excuses to not go to a dinner party. I've used much more lame excuses than that. People are busy. People opt in and opt out all the time. And the judgment in this story, I always want to think, is not as much on the people who said no as on the, the poignant, eager, almost desperate response of the householder who's arranging this dinner party. Because the, the messenger comes back and says, they're not coming. And he says, well, then go out and get some other people, the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, the marginal. And, and the messenger, maybe he even anticipated this, said, sir, what you've ordered has already been done, and there's still more room. And the master said, go out again. The roads and the lanes, and, and compel, almost beg them to come so that my house may be filled. I'm always touched by this poignant response of this, of this householder, and that's my version of telling this story. But to me, there's something about it that's so tender. He needs those people to be there. He needs the house to be full. He needs to feed them, because somehow that's how he gets fed, too. And he needs especially to feed the most marginal, the most vulnerable, as part of his dinner party community. And for Jesus, that's what the world is like when God's in charge, when the world is run according to God's loving will. It is governed by nurture. It is governed by celebration. It is governed by an almost desperate need to bring in as many people as possible. And that's what Jesus means when he uses the word kingdom. He says the kingdom of heaven is like this, a man through a banquet. And that's not a word we use all the time. This is probably, I'm probably going to use the word kingdom in this sermon more than I ever have and more than I ever will again. I like to use rain, words like the reign of God or the kingdom of God. The word kingdom's a little too insistent on its masculinity for my taste, but worse, to, you know, in, in our literary history, it implies hierarchy, it implies domination, it implies someone that we must serve who is not required to serve us. It implies government without regard to the common good. But when Jesus uses it, I always want to believe he's reclaiming some earlier, more original meaning, more original than what we use it to say today, that Jesus is reclaiming maybe and redefining this word. The reading you heard from the book of Samuel reminds us of that older meeting. I don't know why, but the people of Israel wanted a king. They were tired of prophets and judges and wise elders, and maybe they were suffering from a little bit of Babylon inferiority complex. I don't know. But they wanted to be ruled like modern people. And in their defense, their most recent leaders hadn't been models of righteousness. So they go to Samuel and they make this demand, give us a king to govern us like other nations have. Samuel bristles at this. He th thinks this is a horrible idea. 
And so he prays to God for wisdom, and God answers in a way that's every bit as poignant as what that landowner in Jesus' story was. Listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me from being king. Just as they have done to me from the day I had brought them out of Egypt, forsaking me, being idolatrous, now you should listen to them. Just this, warn them. Let them know what they're asking for. And you see in God's response that earlier meaning of lordship. A, a partner God who wants to tenderly love the people and put them first and to serve them even as they serve him. And so you see that same poignant tone. They're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. And so Samuel raises up a king for them, and it goes okay at first, right? Saul's a bit of a disaster, a bit of a mess, but David ushers in a time of faith and nobility and even poetry. Solomon establishes a nation of short-lived but great magnificence. But after that, things go south. The kingdom divides, the kingdom gets conquered, the kingdom becomes unjust, the kingdom goes into exile because of their cruelty to the poor and the stranger, because of their overweening self-regard, because of their faithfulness, and finally their idolatry, their worshiping of things that are not God, as though they were God. So today, my point is to hold up this comparison and to lift up for us the church as an example, as an embodiment of Jesus' version of the kingdom of God. For me, that's the definition of the church. The church is a community of people gathered by God's spirit for the purpose of Jesus' vision of the heavenly reign of the kingdom of God, like an outpost in the desert, a place where people can go and find sanctuary and find compassion and find an upbuilding for their own souls and their own morality and their own way of being in the world. But I can't talk about rulership without at least saying something about our recent election and its fantasies of a new kind of American ruler. It seems to me like a time of real transition, not just in who the leader is, but in how we as a people are thinking about leadership. For me, what's most poignant and dangerous and heartbreaking is not the cast of characters, not all the politicians and the candidates and the talking heads, in this rank and this turgid election drama we've all just been through. For me, what's most alarming is the values that were allowed to arise. Racism, xenophobia, sexism, queer and transphobia, apathy about suffering both home and abroad, the demonization of the refugee, the immigrant, the sojourner, the very people Jesus is very explicit that we're supposed to love and care for. Disdain for God's created world and the delicate ecology we share that sustains life, this brittle machismo and a might-makes-right exaltation of power, these values. And maybe we're told, I'm told, maybe they didn't mean it when they said that stuff. They just knew it. We'd get them some votes. They re really do those things. And my Lord, I hope that's true. But it's hardly comforting. Even so, if, even if they're not going to do those things, that this kind of rhetoric is what wins campaigns is already more disturbing. As followers of Jesus... These values I've listed are not our values. They're the values of some earthly kingdom, 
Not the kingdom Jesus talked about. Not the values of the church as the outpost, as the embodiment of the heavenly reign. So I believe over against the fallen kingdom of earthly rulers, the church is actually the antidote. I believe the community is the antidote to this malaise, this suffering uh, that, that, that that, that we've been wrestling with ever since the pandemic. That, That COVID broke community. And I think without it, these profane values might not have arisen with such strength. If we had not spent two years apart from each other, from our families, the ones we agree with in, in, in good old People's Republic of Ann Arbor, Michigan, and the people we don't agree with so much over in Macomb County on the other side of Detroit. We've developed our private ways. We've mistaken political victory for the common good. So I'm convinced that the antidote to broken community is rebuilt community. And for us, as I say, the name that we give to strong, loving, compassionate, just community in which the vulnerable find sanctuary and wickedness is resisted and the pain of the grieving find healing, the name we give to that is the church. So, yes, we are called to be together. And I want to say, according to today's gospel lesson, we're called to eat together, to nourish each other, to nurture each other, to serve each other, to to make preparations for one another, to welcome one another, to the point of desperation, please come to my party. I'm making lobster bisque. The banquet may be my favorite image for the church, which, as I've said, is my understanding of what Jesus means by the kingdom of God. And so my prayer for us is let's eat together, metaphorically and also literally, because if we want to resist, if we want to support, if we want to love and welcome and provide sanctuary, We will do it as church. Mm -hmm. That's our job. So yes, the next great banquet I have coming up is Thanksgiving at Disney World. And my Washtenaw County, Ann Arbor, Michigan family will be there and my Macomb County family will be there. And they're coming from a different silo from the one I'm coming in. I definitely got siloed too. Uh, And so, I don't want to talk about ivermectin, and I don't want to talk about mRNA vaccine. I want to talk about how their children are. I want to talk about how they're doing in retirement, where they're struggling, where they do have illness and challenges. Because I pray, again, it's not neutrality I want, but it is community. Let's not agree, let's be together and let's be committed to one another and let's feed each other and then we'll see where we end up. Because I pray if I can get over myself and they can get over themselves, we all have our work to do and we can meet around that table. We can rebuild our family community that has been broken by both COVID and politics. And perhaps together we can experience the taste not of supermarket prefab turkey and not of David's mojitos, but the savor, the taste, the pleasant aroma of the true kingdom of God. Amen. Pastor Sarah and I want to share some words with you today, and I'm going to begin with Ecclesiastes Chapter 3, verse 1. There is a time for everything 
and a season for every activity under the heavens. Pastor Sarah and I have come to the um, understanding of this season um, as co-pastor of High Park Union Church uh, coming to an end. Almost six years ago, you called us as co-pastors. Um, as one of the board members said this week, it was a wonderful experiment and it's been an amazing pastorate. But because of the seasons uh, in our lives, most of you know I am now caregiver for my mother who has dementia um, and carry other duties as well as you know. Um, I have come to the place where uh, I need to step aside as pastor. Um, I'll let Pastor Sarah's here. We share this, ooh, I don't know if I can do it without crying either. We share this with so much gratitude and so much love, truly. Um, this has not been an easy decision for either of us, um, but we recognize that as we were called together, after only knowing each other for about three hours cumulatively, um, we also feel the same presence of God saying that it is time for someone new to come and hold this position or someone's new to hold this position. Um, Veronica shared a little bit about what's going on in this season of her life. Um, for myself, Noah and Theo and I are planning to move to Boston, um, which will take us a bit closer to some family. We'll be within driving distance of grandparents for Theo. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm also in the process of a call with a church there, um, an American Baptist church in the area, and I'll share more details as I'm able to. Um, I will also share that this has been not only such a significant time in ministry, um, you all have held me through such important life moments. Um, I have graduated gotten engaged, gotten married during COVID, then gotten married again where we could have people there mm -hmm. and ha got ordained and had a child all while serving here. And so this place and all of you will be part of my story as a minister and as a human for all of my days. And I am so grateful. So this is two months um, notice. Um, so we will be here through the holidays. Uh, we pray that we can do as uh, Reverend Greg encouraged us to do, which is to come together as a community, to eat together, to love on one another. Um, both of our denominations are uh, ready to support the, the congregation. Um, we shared this this past week with the board and now sharing it with uh, you wonderful people, uh, our congregation of High Park Union Church. There is a letter that will be sent that will certainly go to the broader email distribution. And we um, walk into Thanksgiving with gratitude. Um, we pray for an exciting time through the holidays, um, certainly of grieving that is natural, that is human, um, but also gratitude and joy of the season uh, and just the faith that God, just like God called us, uh, and God is calling us into different spaces. God is calling someone into this congregation to be your next pastor. And so thank you for uh, everything. Uh, thank you for this moment. Thank you to our visitors. Um, you know, I wrestled with the fact that we have guests on the day during this announcement, but we are all one um, as, as God's people. And my hope and prayer is that our guests pray for High Park Union Church in the days to come. Um, hold us um, as you are here uh, learning of this as the congregation is learning of it. And think about us and pray for us as we enter this season. God bless you all. Yeah, that wasn't just a sermon about the election. It was a sermon about being the church. You're a tremendous church. You have been, you are, 
and you will be going forward. Keep being the church as you plan, as you make decisions, as you discern what this neighborhood, what this community, what this, all of the many networks and pathways that you are part of require of the kingdom of God at this moment. We, the region, are prepared to uh, help you as, as, as ever we can. Uh, there's lots of great people that you can um, that, that you can be in conversations with about uh, choosing new pastors, uh, about uh, finding good candidates, about making a final choice. Um, but, but you're not in a hurry. You're going to be okay. You're doing okay. And you're going to be fine. I know these are anxious periods for churches. Um, but you're not in this alone. And you have so much to offer the world. God needs you now. And that need, that desperate, insistent invitation God offers to you even today is one that can empower you as you move forward. Thank you.